I don't think any generation of women have had it easy, but I think they do it so that the next generation will have it easy. I think once you have the platform, it's a waste of a platform to have it and to censor yourself. I, it's such a waste of, of that platform of your life and of the voice and of what you could do with it. Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women whose careers and open ethos have pushed the boundaries of what it means to build community and succeed as a collective. I am Betty Kankambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. Nanama Ajiman Asante is my guest today. As a journalist covering politics, gender and business, Nanama has been speaking truth to power and holding governments accountable for years. She provided the much-needed feminist perspective on national issues and debates on radio. Even though this was what she loved doing, it also opened her up to incessant abuse and made her one of the most abused radio hosts in Ghana. This, however, did not stop her from using her platforms to fight for the oppressed in the Ghanaian society. Nanama is a fellow at the Reuters Institute of Journalism at the University of Oxford and the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington, D.C. Her most recent work is the Ghanaian Women Expect Project, which tracked the number of women experts interviewed in Ghanaian media. I'm excited to have Nanama on here today, so let's get right into the conversation. Welcome to Inspiring Open, Nanama. Thank you, Betty. I'm, I'm, it's a joy to be here with you. Um, it's, it's, it's an honor, really. So on here, we'd like to start from the very beginning. Um, can you tell us about your childhood and describe how you were brought up? Oh, gosh. <laughs> there are parts of my life um, that I, I sort of remember. So I remember growing up with my mom first, um, which suggests that my parents, at the time I was born, my parents were not together. They were not living in the same space. Um, so I lived with my mother. And one of my abiding memories is me sitting on the, so my, we lived in an apartment block. And so I remember sitting on the staircase. Um, so this is in Asante Mampo. My mother was teaching in a secondary school there. And I, so I remember sitting, I come out, I sit on the staircase and I was always reading. Um, and then I turned about six and I went to live with my dad in Kumasi, my dad and my stepmother and my stepmother's children. So my, my half siblings, right? So from age six till I went to university, I lived with my dad who's loving and generous and kind, but God, annoyingly strict. He was all about, I say he was because, you know, he's, he died a few years ago, but he was all about, you have to read, you have to work hard, you have to stand up for yourself. So I knew even before I became an adult, that it was a big deal to stand up for oneself. Like I didn't know what I was being prepared for, but my, my dad was, you know, he would say things that sort of signal to things I didn't understand at the time. For instance, he would say, you have to learn how to cook because you may not marry or you may not marry a man who will have a cook, you know? Um, and I'm like, marriage I don't even know what's like what's the point of this but now as you know I'm a grown woman I get what he was talking about at that time so I was raised in a very my dad was loving always present my mom who I tell people is a, a nicer version of me um because she's warmer and open and if she was having this conversation by now you'd be laughing she'd be dishing she wouldn't be overthinking it um, sometimes I wish she would overthink some things because, you know, um, to my, my mom lived, I, I didn't, after I left at the age of six, I didn't go back to live with my mom. But strangely, we've sort of built a great relationship because the women in my father's life were required to show up whenever 
he he needed them to show up for their children. So we sort of have had a great relationship. And my dad, I think I am who I am because of the way my dad brought us up. I remember him say a lot, hearing him say a lot, like, you have to know that you're you you're lucky that you're my child. You know, you're you're lucky because these other children, you know, you're driving by and you see people walking to school by you're sitting in your father's car. And he would make us, you would say, oh, do you have friends or should we pick, he will pick people in the car. Just for me, I think he, my dad was a son of a Methodist preacher. He came from a royal family. He was a chief, but um, the Ghana he grew up in wasn't a wealthy Ghana, you know. So his experiences with um, luck, I think, was different. And he didn't want his children, even though he gave us everything, he didn't want us to be brats. So it was just being drilled into us. This is a privilege and you have to give it back. He constantly said he didn't want to raise children who would be a liability onto themselves and onto society. So my my goal in this life is if I feel at everything else, let me not be a burden. <laughs> let me just, you know, I'm disappointed my dad. But yeah, that's that's how I grew up. I I went to church um, for a bit. You know, everybody in Ghana goes to church when you're growing up. My dad wasn't a even though he was the son of the Methodist minister, he didn't go to church. So, but it was compulsory for us when I was growing up. And at some point, you know, I fell off the wagon and I've been off it since. But yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll drag you back on the wagon very soon. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I cannot, I cannot, like, I cannot look at Ghanaian Christianity. We'll talk about it. We'll but, talk like, about that. Yeah, we'll talk about that later on. What did you study in school and did you always know that you were going to be a journalist and why journalism? I really, I, so I've been told all my life, I loved reading. I loved arguing. I, I loved saying, speaking my mind and then I would do well as a lawyer. And so, because my dad, of my dad's background, my grandfather was a judge. Like it was a lot, every, nearly everybody the men in my family mostly had gone into law. Um, so it was a giving. I knew that I was going to become a lawyer um, even before I went to UCC. And when I went to UCC, I studied um, economics and sociology. And while there, I, you know, you invest, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a hazy period, right? So I knew I was going to become a lawyer because I'd go to court with my dad and then I, I come home um, one vacation. This is when Joy FM had just started. I start listening to Joy FM. I start listening to the midday news. And I'm just blown away by this woman who is grilling all of these men all the time. And I want to be here, which is why I decided I have to move to Accra. I, I have to. And I've lived at home my whole life. The only time I've been away is boarding school or going to uni. And my dad, number one, did not want that. And number two, what? Journalism? So I didn't know I was going to be a journalist. I just heard Matilda Asante. Um, and, I, you know, I, I'd grown up going to my father's community. And I know you know that, you know, that stretch. And so, I mean, I started going there when I was seven. When I was 10, nothing changed. When I was 20, nothing had changed. And I had seen, I had then gone to, I had gone to Cape Coast. I'd seen like the ways people were living at the time. And partly my dad's fault for constantly taking us on these journeys and having these conversations about poverty and privilege with us. So I sort of felt, gosh, we have to do something. I didn't know what, but I thought that whatever it was Matilda Santi was doing, this thing where she was holding people to account, asking them tough questions and exposing them was probably one of the ways to contribute and, and to make sure that life changed. I, it was, I think we come to journalism with we're idealistic when you come, you think you're going to be part of the change, you're going to push and things are going to get better. So I came, I was idealistic. I just came and I thought, Gosh, I have arrived. We're going to make the change. And I, I didn't even last two years in the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even last two years. I, I saw too much. And I was like, gosh, I'm out of here. Is this what you people do? 
you report, you ask the questions and nothing changes. I thought things changed. I, I, thank you very much. Bye. Um, but yeah, I didn't know I was going to be a journalist. And here you are. You've been in it, endured all that you can endure. And, you know, you're still going. But tell me about, because I know you got to work with Matilda Santi. Tell me the kind of influence she had on you when you had to work with her in the same office. You know, when I arrived at Joy, she wasn't there. I think she had gone to school. She had traveled or something. And, you know, she's, Miss Asante, bless her. She's, she's really strict. So everyone in the building is, is terrified of Matilda Asante. Like, she doesn't play. She's, And it's not, you know, people say, I think when you, you work with different types of women, you know, you learn the difference. And so at some time you think this woman is awful. But a lot of people thought she was awful but on hindsight I thought she was just strict and disciplined and she wanted things done when they were supposed to be done like you can't just go on air and conjecture she won't have it she was like so I'll, I'll give you a few instances um when I arrived at Joy I arrived there as a national service person I have to tell you how I went to I went to Joy by myself and asked to see the news editor who was confused and I said I want to work here what do I have to do and he's like, we're not recruiting. I was like, you have to, I have to work here. So you have to tell me what. And he's like, go and write an application letter and bring it. And then we'll see. We'll let you know. That's what I did. And so I finally managed. I harassed Kofi Rusu with phone calls and emails at the time. And I think at some point he was like, ah, okay, it's national service. Let me just bring her in. And I got in. When I got in, I heard about this mean witch, you know, this woman who was going to come and set everything right. But, you know, you are a national service person. You go to a place, you are young. Um, it's a, it's a, it's also a, a phase of your life where men are beginning to pay attention to you. And newsrooms are like that. Like when new people arrive, all the men are all over you and you think you're special. Yeah. And so it was like that. So when she arrived, she, I don't know what she saw in me. I think I did, I, I was doing, I was assigned to do summaries. I took another as he assigned me to do summaries. And I did the summaries and he was like, did somebody help you? And I was like, no. So then it became a thing I do. Um, and so once she looked at something I had done and the next day she said, I should come to lunch with her. And she's like, you know, this woman, all the men are terrified Oh, the women in the newsroom sort of don't like, but she asked me to come to lunch. I am I am shaking, but I go to this lunch. She asked me a thousand and one questions like you're trying to do right now. Um, and then she says to me, she's noticed that the boys like me, the men like me, but in journalism, if I aim to succeed, that cannot be the thing I focus on. I should study and I should focus on the work. Yeah. Um, and there were... There were moments, so there was a point where, because Miss Asante had said you shouldn't pay attention to the, like you should not do the boys that way, um, I sort of, you know, started becoming aware of some things. I mean, I did gender and sexuality, so some of the things you study theoretically in class, in theory in class, become very clear as you're in the workspace. And so I was changing. And as I was changing, the boys I, I had been goofy and smiley with went, you know, pleased with the change. <laughs> so a bunch of them stopped talking to me and it really bothered me, like to come to work and not sort of be liked by the people you thought were your friends. Um, and I remember her saying to me, people were horrible to her when she started. People were mean. And people will be mean to me if I stay the the way, you know, if I stay the course and I, I'm dedicated to the work I learn and I, I do good work. People will, people, my colleagues are going to be mean. Outsiders are going to be mean. But they do not matter because people who care about me will take the time to get to know me and like me. So... Just seeing her, and she was assertive in the newsroom. Like, you could not get around her. <laughs> like, I so badly wanted to sort of just be, like, that disciplined. It wasn't like she was, you know, she didn't partake in some of the, the fun moments, but there were lines she was not going to cross. She wasn't going to get too chummy, so you were rude to her, or you avoided doing the work. That was not going to happen. So she was kind to me, but I knew that I had to deliver. 
And so I did what I had to do. It's just like just seeing her work sort of gave me something to model who I wanted to be eventually if I got into any position of power. And I love that. I mean, I, I love it when women kind of hold other women's hand and then carry them across and be mentors and just inspire them to be who, who they want to be. And so you left Joy after two years, right? Yes. And yes. then you got a job with JHR. Yes. Tell me yes. about, about that job because I, I reckon that it was a human rights organization, yeah, right? I'm sure. Right. So it's a media, it's a media, it's a nonprofit, a Canadian nonprofit that focuses on um, good governance and human rights stories. Um, so they bring in people from Canada to work in Ghanaian newsroom, sort of a sort of um a, a skills transfer thing where they learn how we cover these stories and we learn some of the skills from them and so some by luck I they made me their country coordinator um completely out of my <laughs> my zone um and what I I did was to make sure to build relationship with editors media owners and then manage the people they sent to Ghana also make sure that the people we in the newsrooms that we're working, these because these people are there, we're working on specific good governance and human rights stories. That's what I was doing. Um, and it was, it, it, it also sort of shapes you, right? Because now you're not just, it's not, you, when you see that people are struggling, you see it because in Ghana, it's there, it's in your face. It's, in, it's the hawker, it's the mechanic. It's, you know, you see it, but then, you realize, oh gosh, we actually have to, there are there are things, these things are connected because that poverty is a lack of health care, it's the inability to pay school fees, it's um, a lack of access to legal systems, to justice, these kinds of things. And that you, you get exposed to other people's realities and experiences, and that also sort of shapes you. So for Four years, that's what I did. Sort of managed to come into going to Joy, going to City, bringing in even other senior people from, so JHR will fly in other senior people from um, Canada to sort of come and see what can we do to help Ghanaian media sort of, to strengthen Ghanaian media. So that sort of attuned you to the other side of Ghana. Like there's the human rights aspect. And when I, when I was, I went to Joy with the hope of, you know, we're going to change Ghana, that kind of foolishness. Um, it was good governance. It was good governance for me. But these things work together. You know, you cannot have good governance without giving people justice, without delivering rights to people. So that's where that comes from. The four years was just learning, um, expanding my knowledge in journalism, because also I, I, I didn't train as a journalist. I, I came from economics and sociology. So I had to learn, like, what kinds of questions do you ask if you really want to, if you want people to open up to you? How do you even show up, you know, so that people are open to you? I, all of that was in that, in that JHR space, sort of moving with the trainers and the journalists from different places sort of going to interview people, trying to do produce documentaries. That's where it comes from. Yeah. And I just want to react to something you said, that when you went to Joy and you wanted, hey, things to change, you, you, you describe it as stupid. I don't think it was <laughs> stupid. I really don't think it was stupid at all because I think it's that that drive for change is what keeps you going. And it's what is even from that same like drive, you're yeah, doing what you are doing now. Yeah, so it, it wasn't stupid actually, at all. Yeah, I actually agree. I actually agree. But, you know, I think it's a bit of madness um, <laughs> because to have that kind of hope that change is possible in the face of the evidence to the contrary, because if if you look at Ghana, it's, it's really easy to feel hopeless. It's arrogant to think you can save Ghana or one person can save Ghana. But I think we can sort of put all of us, put our shoulders to the wheel and despite the pain and the disappointment, just do our tiny, tiny bits. And maybe at some point we may get some change. It, it, that's true. And I also just want to mention that that JHR program was so beneficial to me. Um, I learned how to do my first documentary Yay! through that. Um, <laughs> yeah, like a 30 minutes documentary. <laughs> I'd never tried that. And then also, oh. you know, 
these journalists, you know, they've become friends. And for yeah. how many years, you know, some lifelong are still friends. lifelong friends. So uh, it was a very, very interesting program then. From JHR, <laughs> you yeah. came to City FM, yeah. where <laughs> you became <laughs> one of the hosts of the City Breakfast Show. Obviously, a very big breakfast show here in Ghana and beyond, you know, if I should put it that way. And you became the only female voice on there. First of all, talk to me about how you got to City FM and then how you eventually came on the breakfast show. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was working with JHR. I, I, yeah, it was, the, the money was good. And so I thought, I, you know, I'm fine. And one day I came to um, City to speak to, I forget who the editor was. I don't know if it was Salom, but Salom Adonu, I or Patrick Ayumu, one of them. Something had happened. We were, I think, whoever the trainer who was in the newsroom was having some challenges. And so as part of my job, I had to come and speak to the to the editor. But I had met when I started organizing these um, breakfast shows, breakfast um, meetings to talk about how we can cover gay rights and not sort of um, feed into the criminalization that was happening at the time. Um, I had met Samens and he and I had become friendly. He wasn't my friend, but we'd become friendly. And so I, when I went to the newsroom and I had a conversation with the editor and I came down, I'm a Kumasi girl. I'm, you know, you're raised to treat your elders with respect. So I went to look for Samens to say, hi, I came around, whatever. And I met him with Bernard. And so I guess in that, in that moment, I, I don't even remember what we're talking about, but I think I made a comment and Bennett, Bennett said I reminded him of another lady I had met at Joy. Um, her name is Nana Dainchi. She's She left media quickly. <laughs> well, Bennett said I my views reminded him of Nana Dainchi. Do I want to work in radio? I said, God forbid. I have had this experience. <laughs> No, 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 I can't, no, I cannot do this. God forbid, me, you people, you report these stories, nothing changes and you're caught. No, at least this thing that I'm doing, I know that I'm sort of trying to solve a problem and I have some control. You people have no control. I'm not going to do it. But then he says, have you covered elections before? So this is like getting to 2012. Yeah. And I said, no, he said, how are you a journalist and you've not covered elections before and you are happy? <laughs> okay, if you haven't had that experience, you've not had anything. And that really stayed with me. That thing he said, like, if you've not covered elections, you've not done anything. It stayed with me. So I left. I didn't agree that I would work. I left, but I came back and I said, you know, when you said you would give me a job, I really want to have the experience of covering elections. So what can I do? And he said, oh, we need an editor, a, a sub-editor in the newsroom. It's that a role you would want to do? I said, I read. And I think I can make a sentence good, but I am not. That's like, that's not my specialty. And he's like, you, I think you can do it. Um, so here's your, here's your contract, whatever. And then I come to the newsroom. Um, my first year at City was strange. My first maybe six months was really strange for me. I, I say to people, I'm not a people person. I like, I am somebody, who, I have to get to know you. And I, I suppose people have to get to know me to like me. But usually after a few days, people like me. But somehow I see it, nobody liked me for a really long time. <laughs> and you know, and, and I'll complain to my mother. I'll be like, mama, I mean, gosh, you, I don't do anything, but they don't like me. <laughs> and I, I don't know what to do about it. My mother would say, just do your work, and when you have to leave, you leave. It's it's people will like you when they like, you. and if they don't like you, you just have to find a way to survive. And if you say you want to cover the elections, then it's from this period to the elections. Then you can leave. Once you've had that experience, then you can leave. So I decided, okay, I'll just you know, brace, just do that. Um, and strangely things you know Eunice became my friend because also I like food and me if you are eating and 
you invite me to come and eat your food this night. We are eating together, sir. <laughs> it's a thing. We're going to be eating together. Um, so I think, I suppose when Eunice sort of became friendly with me, she sort of created a pathway for other people to see me as a human being um, and not somebody who... I, I don't really know. I mean, you and I have had conversations where you've told me why I was disliked and that it wasn't my fault. Um, but for a really long time, I thought it was something I was doing because I thought, you know, previously people had told me I can be snooty and cheeky. But then she became my friend and she yeah. sort of facilitated everybody. Else, well, not everybody else, because I still was not wholly liked. But I <laughs> Um, at least there was you, there was Ifwa, there was yeah. Sandra, there were these guys. Like suddenly I had friends and I I actually enjoyed staying longer than I ordinarily would. And so I was in a newsroom for maybe a, a year or two. And then I went on leave. After the elections, I took a break. I come back. And by the way, that election made me want to do journalism even more like I did it and it was like I'd been injected reinvigorated I I so wanted to do journalism so I come back from the break and he says we need an online editor you are the editor I'm the editor how I don't I don't have the skills I don't even know what happens there like he's like you will learn like you learn everything else you will learn so I went online and I mean, I like the people I work with, but it was a real challenge because, first of all, that's not what I was trained to do. I mean, you I think in Ghana, journalism is you learn on the job. You sort of have to push yourself. It was overwhelming. You set up an online department with five people and expect them to magically deliver all the stories and to have perfect headlines and to have, we are five people set. <laughs> we can't do that much. Um but there was there were all these expectations of us, and because I think I present a certain way, so they can't bully you, but they'll bully the people you work with. But these are people you like, and so it was really being in online was it was a constant till you till I left city. Being in online was a real struggle for me because these are people I care about, and I see all the challenges. It's not like. You don't discuss it with management. They say they hear you. And yet you go to meetings and they make these guys who are breaking their backs feel like they're not doing enough. You know, there'll be like five writers, maybe two, an editor and an assistant. That's huge. And they're the ones working the whole day. Not that there's another five coming at 12 p.m. They're the ones working the whole day. That structure really stressed me out. Anywho, but I'm in online. The Bernard hosts this the CBS. Um, he and I had started having conversations because I thought he would say things and I'd be like, no, you're wrong in the kitchen. Like we'll have big debates and like I'd be like, no, I don't think it's this. Not that I I my ideas were better. I just thought his ideas were wrong. Like I argued with him. And for some strange reason, he would be on the radio, he would say things, and I would run <laughs> and go. <laughs> And go and be like, no, you're wrong. No, like when he he's playing ads, I'll be like, this, this, and this, and this, and this is why you're wrong. Betty, before I know that I'm the producer, one of the producers of CBS, <laughs> in addition to being in online. <laughs> because I am crazy that I won't shut up. So now I've got to add more responsibility to those other reasons. But I'm like, oh, it's just a few hours. Plus, I love being here and having a conversation with them about some of my wildest thoughts about some of the things happening in Ghana. So he's on air. And sometimes he's on air. Because now I'm a producer, I walk into the studio and be like, I so I will signal to him to put a microphone off. And I will tell him why I think what he's saying is wrong. Oh, whoever is on the radio, whoever is on the phone that he's interviewing is way off. Yeah. And this is please ask him this question I was constantly writing questions like please ask him this question please you know and you know Bernard yes yeah. when he's he's I think Bernard thrives in conversation as well yeah so you you get him going one day he was like sit down sit down I sit down girlfriend Akuto joins me <laughs> and then that's it you become a co-host 
I become a co-host. That's it. That's it. Like, had I known who I was going to come after all of that, I probably would not. But I didn't know. I just thought I have these things to say and nobody was saying it. And I could tell Bernardo I could have a conversation with him. And that was because I'd been having a conversation with him. I I think I didn't anticipate what the reaction of a woman being on radio would be like for people. So now tell me about the reaction of people. <laughs> <laughs> the reaction oh of people. God. Because Nanama, you... I think you will be in the top 10 of some of the most abused women online in Ghana just yeah. because you sit on radio and you have an opinion. You know, I, yeah, I, yeah, I've been having conversations with these men in at City and it was okay. It was okay. They didn't, I mean, they disagreed strongly and vehemently, vigorously, but they went abusive of me. Like nobody said I was stupid. My first year was really horrible. You know, like, first of all, people were calling into the station and saying, tell her to calm down. Like, it's not even like they recognize that I am there. It's like they're telling Ben or Godfrey or whichever man was there to tell me to calm down. And it wasn't enough that they were calling into the station and saying I had been, it was always I had been disrespectful. I, I had said something they didn't like. I had said something they I shouldn't have said. And it, it would be sometimes I would think about it. And I have I have, you know, I, I have my uncles, I have friends. I would text and be like, guys, I said this. Is this a wild idea? Like, because I didn't even think I was saying anything radical at the time. Like some of the things I was saying, like, and then I I'm being trolled. A whole and it's not just a whole day. I think people wake up and decide, ah, we have to pick up where we left off because this woman is back on the radio. I think a lot of the abuse was because I was talking, I was talking about politicians some of the time. I was talking about powerful men in a way that Ghanaian women do not do openly. We some of the things I was saying, I've heard my aunties, I've heard friends, I've heard people say it, it wasn't like they weren't going to say it. The way again, we use indirection a lot uh, in Ghana. So, well, really, especially for our kids, we're not direct. You sort of have to use semantics and sort of cloak. And I would say, I think that was corrupt or that was incompetent. And just these words alone, just saying, I think that was corrupt, would, gosh, people would take my pictures and make all sorts of claims. I have two children. I am hiding. I am sleeping with a married man. I am ugly. The what? ugly thing. <laughs> I didn't know about the two children part. Oh, yeah. Apparently, I have two children with a politician and I am hiding the children. Oh, God. Yeah. It, it was all sorts. So at the time, it was MPP that was in a position. So MPP had paid me and I was sleeping with some key MPP people that I... I didn't even know I hadn't met, you know, like some of them, if they hadn't come to city, I was never going to meet them anywhere. But there was a lot of your ugly, like there was um, a period where this is why my Instagram is locked. People went on my Facebook and Instagram and took my pictures. And I trended for like three days because I said somebody's re response to an accusation was I described the argument as hollow. Like they were, they were so triggered that, you know, she's ugly. She's, it, 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 it was a loss. <laughs> it was hard to take in. I mean, I, because I had people who affirmed me and my father was around. So, and I knew he, me, my father had told me I was beautiful. My mother says I'm special. So I, sometimes I tell myself I am loved and this does not matter, but that's that's when you are comforting yourself, right? Because there are days you look at yourself and you wonder, like, maybe there's some truth here. <laughs> there's some truth here. And actually, you take it so much that you don't realize that it sort of it chips away at your confidence. Yeah. You know? But in in the moment I knew I'm I'm here to do I this is my job, this is what I have to do. So this is my view. And I really I had said to myself. I wasn't going to silence myself so these people win. I wasn't going to let them win. 
So at some point, that was my resolve. Okay, I am ugly. Okay, fine. I okay, you say I'm ugly, it's fine. Um, I'm sleeping with 20 men. Okay, fine. That's your best shot. That's all. You can't, if you can't engage me on the points that I am making, I'm not taking you seriously. So once I may, I resolve that to myself that first of all, they can't even reason. You know, they are so either they are too upset or can't reason. And so I can't, I shouldn't take them too seriously. That's how, like, I would sort of on my way home in the car, I would tell myself these things like, they are wrong. Yeah, they are wrong. Or yeah. actually, this thing that I said I could have, I could have said it better. So I understand why they are triggered. Next time I won't say it like that. But like, I decided I am not going to up and quit in a way that will let them win. But it was, it wasn't just um, the external abuse. It was the internal, the internal pressure, you know, because, because they were abusing me, put pressure on the management of the company. Politicians were emailing and calling about, I was blogging as well and saying things (laughs) that, you know, people were, people I thought journalists should be saying, they weren't saying, and I, I had a blog. It wasn't the station's website. It was my blog. And still, they would get complaints about that. And so there was a lot of take care of the radio. Why have you put this woman who's disrespectful on radio? It was, a, it, was, it was a lot, Betty. But I was really, I'm lucky that my parents are loving people. My dad was around then, so I'm loving. I lived with my sister who would listen to me and be like, well, maybe you know, this other way. And I had really good friends and I had these uncles who, you know, when you are you are related to people or you're friendly with people, they are going to tell you, they are always going to affirm you, right? So I was affirmed a lot. Yeah. I was, there was Jima Buedi, there was Chrissy Brempe, there was Kina, Kua Kua. There were all of these people who affirmed me. Yeah. Like yeah. no matter what's happening online, there were phone calls and family lunches and dinners and, you know, walks where people sort of said, you are not crazy. This is not a wild, like, this is not even a radical thought. I was lucky in that way. I don't, I don't wish my experience on anybody, especially anybody who does not have that kind of support. And I'm glad you circled into support because like we like to talk about tribes here, you know, and finding your people. I've been given examples of how, like certain people have really pulled me through life. And Nanama, you are one of them. Because anytime like I'm in one of those zones, there are certain people you talk to and you realize that you are not crazy. First of all, you are not alone. Like, get up, yeah, you know, yeah. keep moving, yeah. keep moving. It's, it tough is, for it's, everyone. Tough. it's tough for everyone. And I've actually started doing that for people. And I really, I, I love that. And I keep saying that, you know, when somebody pours into you, you have to really pour into others as well. So I'm glad you had your people who were affirming you, who were telling you you were not crazy, who were telling you your ideas are not wild, you know, who were not trying to tame you. And, yeah. you know, you're still here. And I know it took a toll on you health-wise. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, you a doctor told me, um, a doctor told me once, so I have to sort of backtrack. I had a panic attack. I, I had... I was having panic attacks without knowing I was having panic attacks. So this went on for maybe a year. And my mother, I think she had clocked that it may be psychological. She actually came with me on my first um, visit, my conversation with Dr. Deme. So he did tell me immediately that I was having, I was beginning to get depressed. He said, I I have my symptoms points to this. And then after three months of writing down and sending him my notes and everything, he said, you're you're depressed. Because I would, I thought my life was okay, but I was really, I would be getting really sad. And I remember he said, and I said this to him, I said, I I think I'm okay. I I think I have a good job. And he's like, well, are you sure you have a good job? Like, you know, the... the, (laughs) The money and everything may be okay, but maybe there are other triggers that you've not thought about. And he, he was referring to this without the abuse, without referring to the abuse. Because in my in my notes to him in our conversations, I'll talk about 
people sharing my pictures. There's a, there are pictures where my father had died and somebody took a picture of me. And if you, if you see me in that picture, you see that I'm really broken. And these guys were just having fun with that picture. And like, that's a, tr- that was a trigger for me. Yeah. You delude yourself into thinking you can bear it, but the body absorbs it. So it lives in your body. And that's what's manifesting in the way that you feel about things. And so it did, it did, um, it did take a, it did take a toll mentally, um, physically. I mean, I'm no longer on radio and I don't even think I'm over that, like that kind of, um, because I still, certain things really trigger me. I get breathless and I, I didn't used to get panic attacks. I had a happy life. I, I was fine, but now there are certain things I can't see online. There are certain conversations I can't even bear to be a part of because I was like, I was trolled to the point that I thought it, it just left a mark that I, I can't go there again with anybody. Yeah, but I'm, I'm happy you're still standing. And I'm also particularly glad that you're being vulnerable to share the story. So, Nanama, I mean, we can't have this conversation without talking about the state of journalism in Ghana. You wrote an article <laughs> for, <laughs> for uh, Reuters, you yeah. know, when you had your fellowship in the UK. And it was an explosive article because you practically chronicled every single thing that is wrong with the media and the kind of journalism that we we do. And I was particularly annoyed when I saw that article and no media house talked about, discussed that article. This is about us. But then, of course, I guess the sword was (laughs) double-edged. So (laughs) as a journalist also felt yes so um but again i was very disappointed how journalists advocate for everybody but when it comes to a state of a journalist and even the media and journalism we are mum about that what are your feelings about this i you know i feel really sad because i think you know at the beginning i said to you i i came to journalism with i was idealistic because I really believe the tools we have can be tools of change. They are just tools, but you can use them for change. Um, so I, I look at the landscape. I mean, I, I wrote, I sort of knew that they, it was not going to be engaged with. I knew it. When I was writing, I knew it. And people often ask me, like, why, why do you keep writing? And I say, I just want a record to exist that we noticed, you know, because I'm not the only one who's noticed that you've noticed. A lot of people who leave media have noticed this thing. It's just that there isn't a record of it. Plus, if we do really, those of us who say we want to do this work, but to do it in a way where we are not overworked, exploited or abused and harassed, then there has to be a record somewhere. This, this is the thing that we no longer want to repeat, Right. So I knew that it wasn't going to be engaged with. I I knew, I mean, because to engage with it is then for these outlets to say, we have to pay our journalists well. We have to stop these politicians from exploiting the women. We, you know, media managers themselves have to stop preying on the women who work for them. Um, You have to provide health care. You have to do right by your, once you touch it as an outlet, you have to, this is what you, you have to do. And once journalists begin to discuss it, they are signaling to their outlets that we agree with this thing. But we work in newsrooms where people do not have voice. We, you, you, you have to lose. I, I, people say, oh, when you were at CT, you could say everything. I'm like, no, no, yeah. no. I could not. There were things, you know, I could not say. Even on the radio, if you paid attention, you notice that I would be saying something and I like, certain things are happening, right? Even as we are on air. So no, you you go into newsrooms and you lose your voice because the people who own media, um, as a media owner told me, that we are not here to do democracy or free press. Can you imagine owning media? 
and saying to a journalist who me <laughs> I've come I'm like this is the job we're going to do and you're telling me that we're not here to do free press or democracy that means you don't care you're about the profit yeah and it's Nicholas, because again, it's not even just about the pro- profits because New York Times, it's imperfect, but at least they do good journalism and they still get a profit. So it's not like you can't do good journalism and make the money. But this is about power, right? Politicians own these stations or people who are aligned on these stations and focusing and doing true and meaningful journalism means they have to expose their allies and their friends. And that's where the tension is, right? So you work in a, in a pro NDC or a pro MPP outlet, or even if the person is not aligned, they live in the Ghanaian economy. And if they have other businesses, those businesses are going to be impacted. So they weigh the costs and they decide, nah, it's not worth it. I, it's not worth it. Let's let's drop this story. Let's not report it this way. Let's just do the superficial. He says, she said. Plus, Ghanaians are not serious anyway. They're not going to. They're not going to demand change. Forgetting that, if you did true storytelling, where you provided evidence to back your claims, where City or Joy said our findings suggest, not that some people say or NDC says, MPP says. Like I read some stories and I'm like, so. You know, when I was at City, I used to do this. I'm like, but what's what does our investigation say? What have we found ourselves? You know, because we can't go on and say the NDC or the MPP or this group said, but what we? Because this is our job, right? That media is in the state that it is in really frightens me. You have young people in Ghana on social media calling for a coup. And that's a failure of media that yeah. people do not know what they have. Like your whole life changes when you have a coup. Like the idea that people think development will come when you have a dictator. When we are, history even tells us that that's, that's not how it works. Yeah. On the continent, everywhere, the evidence is there that this is not how it works. And so for me, I, I, I look at the state of things and I worry that all you need is for somebody to come in sheep's clothing and distill all of these complaints that people have about the system and decide that I'm I'm changing the constitution even. People will applaud. Yeah. Because we as media have not even shown people that they can liberate themselves. It's it's incredible that like to have all of that media, my one of my uncles says we have too much media, not a lot of journalism which is true, like there's no, there's, everybody's already, we're, we're all talking, but there isn't even, like we're not doing the storytelling, there isn't room for new ideas, new. if you have a new idea in Ghanaian media, you're going to die trying to share that idea. I don't know, if anybody's listening to this and they have some money and they want to fund media, please come to Ghana, we're, we're desperately, I mean, we have a lot of media. Um, the perception in the West is that, Ghana has free media, you know, we rank highly on the on the press freedom index, but that's not all there is because at some point people are going to ask, what do we benefit from these people? I mean, it's gotten so bad that when journalists are assaulted, people are happy. Like, yeah. it's crazy to me, like. It's crazy. It's crazy, Nanama. And of course, we can go on and on and on and on and on about, about this. And sometimes it's so terrifying because you don't see the light at the end of this tunnel that we are in. We can only hope and then pray that when we get the chance, we will be that change that even in a very small way that, that we seek. And, and I hope that, ch- that chance uh, comes a- as, as early as possible. I hope so. I really hope so. Now you are in the U.S. and you're schooling. Yes. And <laughs> it's amazing because for somebody who fell off the church wagon, <laughs> it's amazing what you are studying. We've had this conversation before. When you decided to go that route, people yeah. were like, um, like you, you know, we know your views on this, on that, on that. Why are you going the church route? Why are you doing this? Tell us what you are studying and why you're doing that. Because I think people will find it interesting. (laughs) I'm studying religion right now um, with a focus on Christianity because um, I think Ghana is the way it is for a variety of reasons. And one of them is the way we do religion. And by religion, 
I'm looking specifically at Christianity because it's the dominant religion, 70% of Ghanaians or 71% at some point um, identify as Christians. And I'm, I'm interested in um, how the theology of the church, the Ghanaian church um, in the last 30 years has impacted the way people engage with the Ghanaian states, you know, there was a tweet by Dr. Mensah Otado, one of the prominent pastors in Ghana, something along the lines of don't let the economy determine your blessings. And I found it deeply problematic. And I was talking to, at the time, I had quit the church for years. So I, I said, I, I think this is a dangerous, like this is a ridiculous tweet. It's wrong. It doesn't make sense because we live in this economy. The economy impacts everything. And so to suggest that it is possible to succeed outside the economy is to endorse corruption. Because how else are people going to do it? If How? God has stopped raining manna. You know, there are all of these ideological problems that we have to contend with. And some of the work I have to do, I want to do will be to engage with how Christianity has impacted. And I think there's a specific kind of Christianity and that Christianity came from the U.S. Those are the questions I'm sort of trying to, um, I'm exploring and trying to see. I mean, I don't think I, I have an answer, but I'm just trying to put it out there to say, this kind of Christianity is really not even your Christianity, first of all. That's what I am doing. Um, maybe things will change, maybe they won't, but I just know that our country will not change until the Christianity changes because the church is too yeah. powerful. The church is too it powerful. Is. And I always say that I think the state is the way it is because of the church, honestly. Like, I agree. I, I just wish that as Christians, we could, like you're saying, engage differently and read the Bible even for ourselves and not rely on the various yeah. interpretations these so called men of God give to them, give to, you know, the, the Bible. Read the text yourself. Just you yeah. might find something else. Like, but also, like, for me, at the heart of all of this is. If you say you are a follower of Christ, there are certain things Christ did. He was never on the side of the powerful. Yeah. So I find that like, the alliance between the, like if I, this is why I can't be in the church. Like I am like, you are on the wrong side. The Ghanaian masses are struggling and you are exploiting them together with the political class. I I don't understand. Yeah, that's true. So no, no, now, Let's talk about open because <laughs> this whole podcast, you know, it's also centered on open. So when we say open, even as a personal philosophy, um, what does it mean to you? I think for me, coming from the background that I come from, I think it's just being transparent um, and being inclusive. Um, these things mean a lot to me. Um I think to be open is to share, to share is to be transparent, to say, I called the minister in X, Y, Z, and this is the backstory. Like all the, all the details we hide from people, if we're being open and transparent, like if we're being open, we'll be transparent and, and disclose these details. That's us being open. Um, I think being open for me in life is being generous and loving with my community. I feel people who have seen what you've been through as a journalist, as a, a woman on air, sharing your opinion. I can bet you there are a lot of women on air right now who are really self-censoring because they are afraid to, of course, go through what you went through because it was it was really intense, Anama. And it's yeah. still intense because you still have a voice on Twitter. A loud voice on Twitter. I know. It's yes, massive. You, know, and you, you still get it there. But what do, would you want to tell a woman who has this platform on air and is self-censoring because she doesn't want to be abused because she's seen what you've been through? I don't think any generation of women had it easy. Um, I mean, we spoke to Dr. Gajapo, Audrey Gajapo who also used to be on TV. And I don't even think, because, you know, that was a different generation. So I'm sure Dr. Gajapo was, you know, much nicer than I was. And even she did not have it easy in, in public life. Um, 
So I don't think any generation of women have had it easy, but I think they do it so that the next generation will have it easy. I think once you have the platform, it's a waste of a platform to have it and to censor yourself. I, it's such a waste of, of that platform of your life and of the voice and of what you could do with it. I feel once you have that platform, just make it a point to advocate for yourself and for the women coming before, because that's that's an example you're setting. And I know that it's like, it took a toll, I still have triggers, but I'm not go- if I had to do it all over again, I'd probably do it the same. Not a lot will change. I think that once you have a platform, it's a waste to not use the voice and, and to censor yourself and to and to be chummy with the people who are actually oppressing you, you know? Yeah, that part. Yeah. <laughs> people are oppressed. Like, why are we smiling with these people? They don't I know, like right? That. Yeah. Right? I guess for a lot of journalists, it's what they will get. Yeah, and, and I know. And I also think, I, I should probably say this here, because I think, I have to say, I come from privilege. It's not like I was born into a lot of money, but... I I come from privilege. So I always knew I could go home if I was sacked. And I recognize that a lot of journalists do not have that. And so there's a there's a delicate balance there. But in our quest to free ourselves, we have to work together. So I am amazed that we still don't have unions in places because journalists need protections to sort of assert themselves. Just be smart about how you sort of do what you have to do in standing up for yourself and in using your voice. Yeah, that's a very important point. So, Nanama. Yes. You know, and I've asked a lot of um, women, you know, advocates that I've, I've, I've actually interviewed for this podcast. And because you in particular, I was there when yeah. somebody we we worked with asked if you, you have a love, you have a man. And I told the person, ah, Nanama. <laughs> Nanama is in a relationship. I don't know where people get that idea from because I think I think you really have to be weak to be intimidated by this thing that I am doing on radio. Like the whole time I was on on City, I was in a relationship. I've always been in a relationship, like in loving, um, warm and happy relationships, relationships that I'm happy with. Like my the relationship I am in was a relationship I was in in the last six years. Oh, yeah, six years, twenty seven years. He's not intimidated by me. I do some things and he thinks I like fighting, but it's not a source of tension between us. Um, I so I suppose it's also because we sort of have the same politics. Like we care about some of the same things. My work has never been a source of tension. In fact, I think it is what attracted him to me. So. That I don't have a man that and it's also crazy for me how people like make those connections. Like I'm doing my job. What has that got to do with whether I have a man or I don't have a man? You know, it's control, right? I think it's because women are not supposed to speak like that or write like that. We are not supposed to in in the like in the Ghanaian context, we are not we're supposed to be seen and not heard. That's ridiculous. That's not how it works. <laughs> it is ridiculous. <laughs> Nanama, this has been such a delightful conversation. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you did this. Thank you, Nanama, for not backing down despite the abuse and all the attempts to silence you. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund, Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the Chairman Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts we are at Wiki Loves Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, 
then we are made silent by the patriarchy and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open. Open.